our speaker tonight is Dr. Michael Glazer. Um, he is the author of eight collections of poetry himself, the editor of many anthologies. He is the former poet laureate of the state of Maryland, um, an accomplished poet for over 30 years. What in my mind always connects him to Lucille is that he is somebody who over that, that long period of, of writing poetry, of disseminating poetry, of being a passionate advocate for poetry in the community, always writes poetry that is not afraid to be personal, but is never only personal. It has the courage to bring us human moments of love, love's failures and triumphs that we all share. In that, I think he shared a quality with Lucille Clifton that was, that was a Part, a part of the friendship that knit them for so many years. Michael is the, uh, one of the editors of the collection of Lucille Clifton's poetry that has just come out uh, in September. This is her life work. It's a, it's a wonderful anthology. I uh, just found out today that Publishers Weekly named it one of the best books of, of 2012. It is uh, something I, on sale out there, and I, and I uh, urge you to pick up a copy. One of one of our conversations before the reading um, with with Neil, Neil was talking about being without power for about 24 hours during the last hurricane, and therefore with a lantern sitting and reading the book from cover to cover, reading the poetry from cover to cover, and he described it as uh, something something because of those circumstances and. You know, you're forced suddenly to be out of that normal routine of things you have to do and have to get done and you know, have to put your attention to because of that, that vacation from the normal. It's a great way to look at the inconvenience of a hurricane. You know. um, because of that vacation from the normal, he was, he was able to do that and felt like it put him into a different place. It put him into a, a more peaceful place. And that's something that poetry can do. Um, Michael's friendship with Lucille is something that, that I always think of with, uh, with affection and with awe and with love. He was someone who eased her in her life. That is, always there as a friend, always there to, to lend an ear, always there to speak to her, always there to drive her places, always there to take her to the hospital, uh, always there even to her last moments on her deathbed. And I know that Lucille could, would not have picked anybody else to have been um, the editor of her, of her work. Michael, Lucille, and I had a custom of uh, going once a week to uh, Linda's Cafe for, for uh, breakfast. And the three of us would, would sit there and not just, you know, solve, not just solve the problems of the world and, and the literary world, uh, but mainly just relax. Lucille was grateful in those moments that she could put aside her public persona, the famous poet mask, and just shove cholesterol into her system like a normal person. I think Linda's was for us what Hemingway's clean, well-lighted place is, meaning a place of safety where masks could be removed. And what was revealed underneath was accepted in love. I think Lucille's poetry, as opposed to her, her public personality, you know, as the famous poet, what her, what her poetry was, was the same thing for many people, that it was some clean, well-lighted place, not some lofty city on a hill, not some sacred palace of literature, but a place set in the real world where they could recognize and nourish themselves and what needed to be recognized and nourished in themselves. This is a poem by Lucille. I'm going to take a little of Michael's time and read one. It's called Fury for Mama. And the situation in this poem was that Lucille always remembers that her mother would write poetry. And her father did not like that her mother wrote poetry. So at one, at one point, her father took all of her mother's poems and put them into the furnace. So the title of the poem is Fury for Mama. Remember this, she is standing by the furnace, the coals glisten like rubies. Her hand is crying, her hand is clutching a sheaf of papers, poems. She gives them up, they burn jewels into jewels. Her eyes are animals. 
Each hank of her hair is a serpent's obedient wife. She will never recover. Remember, there is nothing you will not bear for this woman's sake. Lucille's life threw so much at her that would have broken and destroyed a lesser spirit, but she knew that if she could find the words to express her personal wounds, her private pain, they would not only sustain her, but would also express the wounds and pains of many people, of people who couldn't find the words because they'd been stolen from their mouths or burned in front of their eyes, as her mother's poems once were. Her words were a mirror in which people found themselves and a window into other lives, and she showed people they were the same, the mirror and the window. It is why so many people she never met loved her. They knew the words already, but they had been stolen or burned or lost in their way through the world or buried in shame. And when they came again through Lucille's mouth or pen, people recognized them and loved her. She always found their words. Sometimes you could hear the fury trembling under them, sometimes the sadness, and many times you could hear the laughter. She turned it all into beauty. Thank you all for being here and for coming to share with me a remembrance of and reflection about our friend and colleague and mentor, Lucille Clifton. Her life and poetry touched many of us. She was a woman whose work continues to carry forward her spirit and her commitment to truth and justice and compassion. Lucille was kind and thoughtful and courageous. She was brave personally, brave both as a teacher and a poet, and brave politically as a truth teller, as one who used poetry to bear witness to what she saw and understood. She chose for herself the larger task of going outside the often self-absorbed and privileged terrain of many contemporary poets, and chose rather to live and write from a landscape where others live, the oppressed and discriminated against, the workers and maids, the abused and the sick, the revolutionaries and the executed, the forgotten and the ignored. There is no calm center, no rest in Lucille's poetry. We're jostled awake again and again by the starkness and clarity of her concerns and her language. Even when her work is humorous, it has an edge that moves it from the merely funny into the insightful and powerful. So what I'd like to do this evening is try to pull together a number of Lucille's poems, weave them with the purpose of illustrating why her work is so important and deeply valued by so many. So let me begin with one of her early poems, but newly collected in this new volume of her collected poems. That um, expresses a theme that I think is found throughout her poetry. The poem is called, All of Us Are All of Us. Malcolm and Martin, George, Little Emmett, Billy of the Flower, the flower, Bessie, all of us are all of us. Nat, Gabriel, Denmark, Patrice and Kwame, Marcus, Black Hampton, all of us are all of us. Step and fetch it, Amos and Andy, Sapphire and Uncle Tom, all of us are all of us. Orangeburg, Jackson, Birmingham, here. My mama, your daddy, your mama, Oh, all of us are all of us. And this, this is a poem about love. The poem was written probably around 1973 to 74. It captures, as I said, a theme found throughout her poetry. We are all of us, all of us. Each different, of course, but each similar, human, with hopes and fears, dreams and hungers, foibles and follies. I am often struck by how Lucille Clifton's poems combine an empathy and compassion for most all living beings and yet also insist on our accountability for the choices we make or fail to make. In the uncertain world that we live in, Lucille noticed that the things in her life, sometimes odd, 
sometimes strange and fearful, sometimes joyful or horrifying. We're not uniquely unusual. Rather, they were part of the very nature of being human. I believe in what is human, she would say. I believe there is humanness in everybody, and I try to be true to that which is human in me. Or she would later write in her poem, September Song, I bear witness to no thing more human than hate. I bear witness to no thing more human than love. Apples and honey, apples and honey. What is not lost is paradise. Boom, the microphone. What is not lost <laughs> is paradise. A tremendous line. What is not lost is paradise. And the wonderful way she had of turning things, you know, however much we suffer, and we do, and probably nobody, as Wayne suggested in his introductory comments, n nobody that I know suffered more than Lucille. And still to be able to not feel sorry for yourself, but to say, you know, what is not lost, that's paradise. Lucille's commitment was to discern and name the truth of what she saw to understand the complexity of the human world and report out. The reason why I do it, she wrote in her poem, The Making of Poems, the reason why I do it though I fail and fail in the giving of true names is I am Adam and his mother and these failures are my job. I'm fascinated by the language of that poem. The reason why I do it, writing, though I fail and fail in the giving of true names, is I am Adam and his mother, and these failures are my job. True names. I am Adam and his mother. So Lucille believed that the job of the writer is to give things their true names. And she was often fond of saying that the writer has an obligation to the truth, not necessarily the facts, which can be manipulated, but the truth, as in that poem, The Reason Why I Do It. I am caught by her words. I am Adam and his mother, and these failures are my job. Think about that. Who was Adam's mother? And can you hear his mother saying, Oh, my son, look what you've done. How have I failed you? Where did I go wrong? What are the facts here? What is the truth? Another one of her poems that I treasure for its attention to language is Blessing the Boats at St. Mary's, which is influenced, of course, by the annual blessing of the fleet at St. Clement's Island, and also, I'm sure, by the Irish blessing, may the road rise up to meet you, may the wind be ever at your back. Lucille's poem reads as follows. Blessing the Boats at St. Mary's. May the tide that is entering even now, the lip of our understanding, carry you out beyond the face of fear. May you kiss the wind, then turn from it, certain that it will love your back. May you open your eyes to water, water waving forever. And may you, in your innocence, sail through this to that. A lovely poem, a lovely blessing. The language that intrigues me is the line, may you, in your innocence, sail through this to that. I note the word innocence. What does that mean to you? How would it be different if she had written, may you in your ignorance sail through this to that? What is the difference? A great joy of reading a good poet is that the words you know are chosen carefully 
Why did she choose innocence? What's the difference between that and ignorance? As a teacher, Lucille liked to say that she wanted to make sure her students would never be able to say, nobody ever told me. She would often require that her students read Howard Zinn's book, A People's History of the United States, a book which presents American history as seen through the eyes of the common people rather than the political and economic elite who traditionally have written our histories. As an example, when I was in school, I learned about Manifest Destiny and the great westward expansion. What Zinn's book teaches that I never learned in school is that Manifest Destiny embraced the genocide of the Native American peoples. In school, I learned about World War II and the horrible Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor. But I never heard about what Zen's book teaches of the horrible things America did to its Japanese citizens by rounding them up and placing them in so-called relocation camps, which were actually internment camps and horrible places to have to live. Lucille wanted her students to know about these things. She wanted us all to be knowledgeable and aware. She especially wanted us to escape the ignorance that enables one to feel self-righteous about the privilege and blessed lives most of us in America are able to live. Let me give you another brief example. After Lucille decided that she would stay at St. Mary's College, I can write there, you know, she said. She was always concerned where she was going to live, where she was going to work. Can I write there? If the answer was yep, it was okay. Because she could write at St. Mary's College. We were lucky. The college, after she decided she'd stay, the college found her a home on the water. The college was very proud to be able to provide her with such a wonderful location. She scoffed a little. And while she grew to enjoy living on the water, she said at first, black people don't like water. That's a white person's thing. I can't even swim. So think about that. Why would Lucille, an African American, not be thrilled to live on the water? Listen to her poem. Her poem. Listen to her poem, Slave Ships. This is a poem about three ships that took free people, free people from Africa, captured, chained, and bound, brought them across the ocean, and dumped them in the United States to be sold as slaves. The names of these ships were Jesus, Angel, and Grace of God. These ships were named Jesus, Angel, and Grace of God. And it strikes me as I say that. Now that's a perfect example of ignorance. <laughs> Not innocence, ignorance. Slave ships, Lucille's poem. Loaded like spoons into the belly of Jesus, where we lay for weeks, for months, in the sweat and stink of our own breathing. Jesus. Why do you not protect us, chained to the heart of the angel, where the prayers we never tell are hot and red as our bloody ankles? Jesus, angel, can these be men who vomit us out from ships called Jesus, angel, grace of God, onto a heathen country? Jesus, angel ever again. Can this tongue speak? Can these bones walk? Grace of God, can this sin live? My grandparents, perhaps yours too, or your great-grandparents, came across the ocean to the United States filled with hopes and dreams visions of a better life for themselves and their children and their families. 
Lucille's ancestors came across a very different ocean, you know, very different water. How do we learn? How do we learn to pay attention to such things? How do we find ways to move away from ignorance even while being able to embrace our innocence? Such a remarkable difference, such an amazing distinction Lucille was in her own quiet, witnessing way making. She would also use humor as a way of making her observations about ignorance and innocence, about oppression and repression, about sexist attitudes. Take, for example, her poem, Wishes for Sons. It, just imagine me as a woman reading this if you want. Wishes for Sons, Lucille Clifton. I wish them cramps. I wish them a strange town and the last tampon. <laughs> I wish them no 7-Eleven. I wish them one week early and wearing a white skirt. I wish them one week late. Later, I wish them hot flashes and clots like you wouldn't believe. Let the flashes come when they meet someone special. Let the clots come when they want to. Let them think they have accepted arrogance in the universe, then bring them to gynecologists not unlike themselves. Lucille was, of course, concerned about what we often call political issues. But as Emily Dickinson might say, she usually told it slant. For example, when Lucille was Poet Laureate of Maryland from 1979 to 1985, Maryland engaged in celebrating its 350th anniversary. And the governor's office thought it might be nice if the Poet Laureate of Maryland wrote a poem to commemorate the anniversary and be a part of the celebration. Now you should know that Lucille was not much inclined to write occasional poems. But being the state poet, she thought she should consider the possibility, so she asked what the theme of the celebration would be. And she was informed that part of the focus would be our good old colonial days. Well, she could have been outraged and written an angry poem about being asked to write to help celebrate the days of slavery, but here's what she wrote. Why some people be mad at me sometimes. They ask me to remember, but they want me to remember their memories, and I keep remembering mine. They ask me to remember, but they want me to remember their memories. And I, I keep remembering mine. Slant, but right on the money, yeah? Better than being merely a political poem, it becomes a poem that gives voice to the voiceless, that speaks out about the importance of not letting oneself be co-opted by the powerful. Lucille's poetry teaches how one can find the courage to stand up to oppression, to ignorance, and injustice. It models how to show up, how to affirm our place, and by our very presence, bring to bear on our world the power of our individual lives. This is the truth that she lived. It is what her poems return to again and again and it is, I believe, how she modeled for all of us how to be brave and honest and present. Another example, a more outspoken one, her poem, Jasper, Texas, 1998, which is based on the death of James Byrd, Jr., who was picked up one night by three white supremacists, chained and dragged for three miles behind their pickup truck 
when they finally stopped and left the remains of his body at the edge of a cemetery. His head had come off and one arm. And while Lucille's poem bears witness to the particular facts of Byrd's murder, notice how it also addresses the larger issues of violence and racial intolerance. So sh she gives the speaker in this poem is, becomes James Byrd's head left behind. Jasper, Texas, 1998 for J. Byrd. I am a man's head hunched in the road. I was chosen to speak by the members of my body. The arm, as it pulled away, pointed toward me. The hand opened once and was gone. Why and why and why should I call a white man brother? Who is the human in this place? The thing that is dragged or the dragger? What does my daughter say? The sun is a blister overhead. If I were alive, I could not bear it. The townsfolk sing we shall overcome while hope bleeds slowly from my mouth into the dirt that covers us all. I am done with this dust. I am done. Lucille paid attention. She sought to give voice to the voiceless. Her poems are not often strident, but when there was need to speak out directly, her words ring with clarity and power, as they do in that poem. It was not uncommon for Lucille to use the device of asking questions, and when she did, she did so with an unmatched ability to turn anger into daggers like her line, why and why and why should I call a white man brother? Or another example from her poem about September 11, 2001. Is it treason to remember, she asks, is it treason to remember what we have done to deserve such villainy? Nothing, we reassure ourselves, nothing. I admire anyone who has the courage to be able to look experience straight in the eye, to see the complexity of what is happening and to report out about what is seen truthfully and with clarity. Lucille was exceptional at this. Here's another example. In 1938, the great German writer Bertolt Brecht wrote a poem called To Those Born Later. That's us, those born later. Brecht was writing just before the start of World War II when the Nazis and other fascists threatened much of Europe. What kind of times are these, Brecht wrote, when it's almost a crime to talk about trees because it means keeping still about so many evil deeds. What kinds of times are these when it is almost a crime to talk about trees because it means keeping still about so many evil deeds? Can you think of other countries today where there's similar repression, similar fear, a fear of speaking out against evil? where that fear grips the truth teller, the consequences being large. Adrienne Rich, a sister truth teller and friend of Lucille's, took that line as the title of her own poem, What Kinds of Times Are These? She wrote about a beautiful, historic place off of an old revolutionary road near a meeting house abandoned by the persecuted who disappeared into those shadows. It seems fairly obvious to me that the meeting house represents the desire for freedom 
among those who fought in the Revolutionary War. It is a house, Rich wrote, that others want to buy, sell, make disappear. And then she writes, And I won't tell you where it is, so why do I tell you anything? Because you still listen. Because in times like these, to have you listen at all, it is necessary to talk about trees. This is a theme that Lucille herself picked up on in her untitled poem from the terrible stories that goes like this. Surely I am able to write poems celebrating grass and how the blue in the sky can flow green or red and the waters lean against the Chesapeake shore like a familiar. Poems about nature and landscape, surely. But whenever I begin, the trees wave their knotted branches and why is there under that poem always an other poem? Do you note the use of the dagger sharp question at the end? Why is there always under that poem another poem? Do you see again the struggle to enjoy living on the water, looking out at the tree lined landscape? We look at the branches and see them dancing in the breeze. But Lucille, because she does not ignore her people's history, sees bodies swinging as they are hung, lynched from those branches. But whenever I begin, the trees wave their knotted branches, and why is there under that poem always an other poem? It's a complex world we live in. To be awake in that world requires courage. Lucille modeled that for us amazingly. Her poems keep us awake. They call us into the light and insist that we open that door, that we begin to understand that we live in a complex both and rather than a simple either or world. She explores this idea in her thought-provoking poem of poems about Lucifer, who was, even as Lucille understood herself to be, a light bringer, one who realized, Illumin I illuminate I could, and so illuminate I did. Fascinating. Lucifer saying, illuminate I could, and so illuminate I did. No either or there. Lucifer's not just a bad guy. She's suggesting, and maybe truthfully, that what Lucifer illuminated is the Lucifer in us. And Lucille connected because Lucille's name means light. Lucifer, as you know, was a fallen angel, but originally an angel of light. I try to remember, Lucille said, that there was light in Lucifer. There's Lucille in Lucifer, and there's Lucifer in Lucille. Her courage to embrace the duality of our world enabled her to use the inherent tensions of that duality redemptively, to explore the uncomfortable and the often unspoken. And she wanted that for all of us, for all of us. Aristotle wrote that the unexamined life is not worth living. Lucille discovered that for herself and she wanted us to discover it for ourselves. As she wrote in this poem, The Light That Came to Lucille Clifton. The light that came to Lucille Clifton came in a shift of knowing, when even her fondest sureties faded away. It was the summer she understood that she had not understood and was not mistress even of her own off eye. 
Then the man escaped, throwing away his tie, and the children grew legs and started walking, and she could see the peril of an unexamined life. She closed her eyes, afraid to look, afraid to look for, for her authenticity. But the light insists on itself in the world. A voice from the non-dead past started talking. She closed her ears and it spelled out in her hand, you might as well answer the door, my child. The truth is furiously knocking. You might as well answer the door, my child. The truth is furiously knocking. One final story. Another way that I think Lucille is to be admired for her bravery can be seen in her writing. She created her own style. She did not use capitalization. She used very little punctuation and instead crafted her lines and used sound and space with such skill that her poems on the page tell us how they want to be read. And unlike so many poems that we assign in schools, she wrote to be understood. You, you heard me correctly. Unlike so many poems you are assigned in school, Lucille wrote to be understood. She turned her back on the old masters, the old ways of filling poems with illusions and symbols and metaphors, and rather aimed for clarity. As Michael Collier, another former poet laureate of Maryland, has written, Clifton's poems are direct and accessible. She employs the kind of language that Marianne Moore approvingly called plain American, which cats and dogs can read. The sparing use of punctuation and capital letters gives the poem a modest appearance on the page. She does this to capture the immediacy of contemporary speech and to resist the old hierarchies of verse. I think that's a fairly accurate description of what Lucille was doing. And the story I heard is this. At one of the times that Lucille was being considered for a major honor, and I forget which one this was, um, I know she was considered to be poet, for being poet laureate of the United States several times. And, and a number of other honors. But at one of them, it was reported to her that an older white male poet professor said in justifying his no vote by criticizing Lucille's failure to follow standard and formal structures. He said that while Lucille was good, she was not a master. And thus, the following poem. Study the masters. Study the masters. Like my Aunt Timmy. It was her iron, or one like hers, that smoothed the sheets the master poet slept on. Home or hotel, what matters is he lay himself down on her handiwork and dreamed. She dreamed, too. Words, some Cherokee, some Maasai, some huge and particular as hope. If you had heard her chanting as she ironed, you would understand form and line and discipline and order and America. Plant. Powerful. So let me end my comments by sharing with you two of my favorite Lucille Clifton poems, one older and one new. Both of these poems contain the observations, the insight, and the wisdom that so many of us treasure Lucille's poetry for, the generosity of spirit and truth-telling that mark her work and make her both unique and special among poets. The first is a poem entitled, We Are Running, 
from her book Quilting, a poem that was written probably around 1989. We are running. We are running and running, and time is clocking us from the edge like an only daughter. Our mothers stream before us, cradling their breasts in their hands. Oh, pray that what we want is worth this running. Pray that what we're running toward is what we want. Oh, pray that what we want is worth this running. Pray that we're, what we're running what did I just read? I'm going to start that over. Pray that what we want is worth this running. Pray that what we're running toward is what we want. It's just nice to have that. Stop and ask myself. Steve Jobs, in his 2006 commencement address at Stanford University, which you can find by Googling it, it's a lovely address. It was when he thought he was freed from the pancreatic cancer that eventually killed him. But he was writing about what he learned from that experience. And one of the things he says in that, he says, if I wake up three mornings in a row and I'm not happy about what I have to do that day, I stop myself and say, what's wrong with my life? That's brave. <laughs> I'd be afraid to say that. Pray that what we want is worth this running. Pray that what we're running toward is what we want. And finally, a poem that had not been published until her collected poems came out, a poem written sometime around 2006. It's a poem probably in the voice of God speaking to his son, Adam, who must have been angry about something. Or maybe the poem is Lucille speaking to me, Michael, angry about something. Because certainly Adam and I would agree there is in our world so much to be angry about. Listen to the last poem from her now published Book of Days. God speak, kingdom come. You, with your point-blank fury, what if I told you this is all there ever was? This earth, this garden, this woman, this one precious, perishable kingdom. You, with your point-blank fury, what if I told you this is all there ever was? This earth, this garden, this woman, this one precious, perishable kingdom. Lucille Clifton. Thank you. My answer is that there is one. I think it's pretty lousy, um, and I would not recommend it. I am in the process of trying to convince Dana Green, who thought of this idea in herself. Dana Green has just written an astonishingly wonderful and thought-provoking biography of Denise Levertov. And Dana was at St. Mary's and knew Lucille and is contemplating doing that. It's very difficult work. Um, you know, to write a good biography, you, you have to get into somebody's life. And as I said, I mean, Lucille lived a very painful life. You can't do a good job unless you go there and live with her and then try to report out differently than she did. Um, but Dana's interested in doing that, and, um, and I hope she will. But the answer right now is no, there's not. So when Lucille was leaving St. Mary's, 
um, in 2006. And her office was right across from mine. Can I tell you a wonderful story about her? Um, in like 1974 at St. Mary's, the president got a new assistant and um, none of us had name tags on our doors. We were basically a brand new four-year school. And so this assistant's first job was to go around and put name tags on our doors. And he was checking with everybody. And he got to me, and I was president of, president of the faculty senate at the time. And he said, should I put English or faculty senate? And I said, could I have poet? He said, I don't care. <laughs> so I had the science of Michael Glazer poet. And I kind of loved it. And 1984, about 10 years later, uh, the wonderful um, Pulitzer Prize winning former consultant to Poetry Library of Congress, William Meredith, was coming to our campus to visit. And I'm taking my office and he sees that sign on the door. This is a man I revered. And he says, nobody has a right to call themselves a poet. Other people can call you a poet, but you don't have a right to call yourself a poet. And I understood what he said and I agreed with him and I said thank you and I didn't take it down because I loved having it up. So then let's move up the head to 1989 and Lucille's coming to campus and her office is going to be across from mine and I'm driving to campus and we're having a nice talk and I realize as I'm walking her in to show her where her office was that I've got this sign on my door. <laughs> this is Michael Glaser, poet. I, I was so embarrassed and I apologized to her. And what Lucille did, she called up maintenance she asked them to find that old machine that makes that sign. And she got them to make her a sign that said, Lucille Clifton, other poet. <laughs> How do you not love a woman like that, you know? What, what an amazing thing. So where were we? Um, the question was? Lost poem. Lost poem. So when Lucille's leaving her office, I had brought her two great big waste baskets to throw stuff away in. And this was probably on a Friday and we drove her back to Columbia and Saturday I'm in my office and I'm staring at these waste baskets and I'm thinking to myself, you know, this is a really famous poet. Two waste baskets full of stuff. She's, I think I better go through these things <laughs> and see what I could find. And I pulled out some, some of her teaching syllabi's. Um, she called them road maps and I thought they were lovely and I pulled out some other things that I thought were useful and um, put them kind of all in a file and forgot about them. And, and then when I was asked to co-edit with Kevin Young the collected poems, I also remembered and I'd been wanting to check on this anyways, that um, there was a period of time and I forget now the exact year, it's in, in the book and in her books, when, when there were messages from the ones, she called them, that she was really doing like automatic writing. She was sitting in her office receiving these things, these ones were telling her what to write. And she was doing this and like sweating and writing it down and when it was all done, um, she held on for a while and then she gave them to me and said, hold on to these. I don't think I want to keep them but I can't throw them away. So I took them and put them somewhere and then I found out six years later that she published them. <laughs> That makes perfect sense. Lucy would not give me the only copy of anything that she had. Um, and I always kind of wanted to check and see if what she published as the message from the ones was the same thing that she'd given me. So I went looking for them again and what I found in my file folder for Lucille was some poems that I had pulled out of her trash cans and there are the, the last poems, there are like 26 of them in her book, the, that one that God Speak Kingdom Come is the last one of those that I read. So, and this is kind of the editor's dilemma, don't let it go out of this room. Um, they look like Lucille's poems. They sound like Lucille's poems. What do you think, Kevin? Look to me like Lucille's poems. Lucille's daughter, Alexia, says, I, I think I remember mom talking about those things. So, I mean, her name was not on them. Why would she put her name on her own poems? So. And, and of course it makes the anthology that much more valuable and more people will buy it, you know, because there are new poems in there. So we publish them. And, and I keep waiting for some former student to say, what the hell? <laughs> I wrote these for her class. It was, it was in the voice of Lucille Clifton. I got an A for these poems. What, it, what do you mean she wrote them? <laughs> um, so as best we know, <laughs> 
there are those new poems. And then some other poems that, that in Kevin is the curator of Lucille's papers mm -hmm. at Emory University. And there, there were files full of poems, as he writes in, in the collected poems, um, files that said, you know, old poems, poems to be revised, maybe poems to be thrown out. And we went through those and, and tried to find, um, we, we used some of them, not all of them, because a lot of them should be thrown mm -hmm. out. But there were enough that were fairly good and particularly interesting because you can see how Lucille is developing her style. She's using capital letters and then sometimes not. She starts not using a capital I, st starts using less and less punctuation. So it's really interesting in terms of the historical development of her style. So we included enough of those, partly because they were good and partly because it really helps those who are interested see how that style slowly evolved into what she became quite well known for. And not a master poet, but a really good poet. That's the question I like to ask students. What are you doing asking me that? <laughs> I, I, I won't even go there, but I will tell you another little story. Uh, <laughs> Lucille, um, did not really like animals. She lived, <laughs> she lived, one of the houses before she moved in the water, she, she lived in a house that had a vole in it. And she was very unhappy there. So I went and put a vole trap and we caught the thing. I don't know if you know voles. They, they're fuzzy, furry little things like mice, but they're a little bit bigger and they, and they but they run like this, you know, instead of like that. They <laughs> and it was freaking her out. So we caught that thing and then we put one of those supersonic sound things that I would never hear because of my deafness yeah, that scare animals out of your house. She moved out of there. And then she moved into some apartments. I forget which one's on. Um, no, not Cedar Cove. That was the first place she lived. The, the, the on, Willows. on Willows, right. And um, this red fox started showing up at her door. <laughs> she has a whole series of fox poems you can read in the terrible stories and in her collected poems. And um, she didn't like this at all. Um, her friend Ann Casson also lived in those apartments and at the end of one semester, they switched apartments. And guess what? The fox followed <laughs> Lucille. <laughs> so she knew that there was some kind of affinity here but she didn't know what it was and she was not happy about it. But it was kind of like, you know, whatever this is about, it's being sent to me and I need to try to understand that even though I don't like it. And, and thus these fox poems and they're interesting, they're interesting to read. So if you were an animal, maybe you'd be that fox outside Lucille's apartment door, but I don't know what Lucille would be. Thank you for that question. I, because I was most surprised, um, very clearly. It, w when Lucille gave readings, um, she was the most generous, interesting, kind person. She'd read poems about white racists and she'd say things like, now this, this isn't about anybody in here, we understand that, but this, you know. And so she could, would enable me and I think lots of other white people to feel like we're all part of this, we're all in this together, we are trying to make a better world together. She's not criticizing me. I went to a reading by the poet A.I. I once who was a very fierce feminist and black poet and I, I just sat there cringing in my seat covering my groin because I was afraid I was going to get assassinated or castrated or both. Um, <laughs> Lucille never made you feel that way. Um, and she was funny. And she'd read her poems like the, the one I read about 
um, Wishes for My Sons, and other, other feminist poems. Um, and you'd, you'd laugh and you'd celebrate with her. Um, so in reading all of her poems through, which I had never really done before, and I did three times, you know, it, it's, um, I was so struck by how consistently they don't let up demanding that I, as a reader, be accountable for what I'm thinking, what I'm doing, how I'm seeing the world, how I'm not seeing the world. The, the, the poems themselves have none of that softness that she always had at her readings. And I was very impressed by that. She doesn't let up for a second. There's such integrity in how she lived and wrote and put, for, put forward her truth in the world. I was, I was startled by it um, and, and also, in retrospect, delighted by it. I think the process of reading through her poems several times has made me a much better poet, much more aware of the language I choose, what I'm saying, when I'm BSing, when I'm telling the truth. So that was, that was the great joy of, of doing this. All right, thanks so much. <laughs>